I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak. It's, I think, one of the more extraordinary conferences of what you've heard over the last, uh, last day and will continue to hear through the exciting aspects of today's presentations. Uh, a lot of the topics that were discussed uh, yesterday sort of uh, were a prelude to mine are going to help me out in skirting through some, uh, some areas uh, that were really covered in great and extensive detail yesterday. Uh, Chiari malformation has a long and uh, um, interesting story, and I'd like to try to put a little bit of a historical perspective on our, um, the evolution of our understanding about this disorder, which really date, dates back to the mid-1800s. Uh, Chiari first described uh, about six patients in about 1860 that actually had tonsillar descent. These were all uh, recognized on autopsy uh, cases, which is pretty much how Chiari got understood early on. And uh, interestingly enough, those initial six patients had hydrocephalus and had tonsillar descent related to uh, pressure from above pushing the tonsils down. We understand over the course of the last 150 or 60 odd years that there are a lot of ways to present uh, with what has been referred to now as a Chiari malformation defined by tonsillar descent. There's been a lot of uh, water under the bridge since that time, and I'd like to take you through a couple of steps uh, and then um, go forward. Our objectives today are to review the structural aspects of the posterior cranial fossa and the cervical, um, the craniocervical junction. A lot of that groundwork has been laid yesterday. I want to develop an understanding of the importance of CSF flow in the region and clinical patterns of cervical medullary dysfunction resulting from structural abnormalities in that region. And then we want to be able to formulate a differential diagnosis for cerebellar tonsillar descent, or what has been called a Chiari 1 malformation and syringomyelia. There's a, really a, a disjunction uh, that will help patients understand where the problems are in the clinical interface. Uh, you've heard a lot of discussions. Diseases really get described by initial presentations where the disease is identified by either tonsillar descent or uh, or we, are, we develop our understanding about a disease by representative cases. Uh, that structure gets laid by cases that are identified, but patients actually don't come with labels, and that's where the disjunction gets uh, mired, because physicians are looking at patients. Patients don't have labels. They have symptoms, and the symptoms have to be uh, have a gestalt sort of relationship to what the, what the individual physician is uh, looking at and identifying in the patient. Unless uh, we understand what that symptom complex is like, we're not going to be able to sort through the issues and get to a clinical diagnosis. Medicine is really <clears throat> a relatively simplistic uh, endeavor that is much like uh, trying to tell the difference between a horse, a zebra, and a jackass. Uh, it's uh, really done by gestalt. Physicians recognize patients by their clinical presentations, not by their autopsy findings. That's at the end of the road, obviously. So that's where the problem is. And we've been, made a great deal of progress in understanding what Chiari malformation is like, but we haven't made a lot of uh, progress in understanding how you identify these patients in, a, in the setting of clinical presentations. Uh, much of what has been discussed so far has had to do with uh, uh, neurosurgical understanding and how the management of that, that uh, these diseases can take place and what might be done and how the, the presentation is understood in that regard. But uh, we want to take a step back and see how we progress forward in better, better understanding. The traditional uh, neuro neurological dogma dates back to the uh, 1890s really up to and after the uh, Second World War, when specialty neurology uh, practice was really better defined. The American Academy of Neurology dates to about that time after World War II. Uh, and uh, uh, carry malformation at the early time, after the initial pathologic uh, uh, identifications were made, really uh, typified the patient as one having a chronic uh, a cough headache, ataxia, and downbeat nystagmus. 
And that's how neurologists sort of were looking at patients. And these were really patients that uh, were more or less end-stage cases. Chiari malformation was thought to be a relatively rare disorder and was poorly understood. Syringomyelia was even much rarer and not well understood because it wasn't until the, until the uh, uh, last 15 or 20 years where imaging techniques have been available that really were able to identify these uh, fluid-filled areas in the spinal cord uh, without actually having a pathologic or autopsy identification of it. So syringomyelia to the itinerant neurologist uh, over these last hundred years was identified by a, what was called a suspended dissociated sensory loss which is kind of paradoxical and difficult to understand for many people because you can feel and touch and identify where you're being touched and whether it's a heavy or a light touch, but pain is not identified. People will inadvertently burn their hands, cut themselves, they don't feel pain, and they don't feel uh, oftentimes thermal sensation because these uh, pathways move across the center of the spinal cord where the syrinx is uh, causing problems and pressing and damaging these uh, tracks that transmit to the central nervous system the uh, sensory input for pain, temperature, or thermal sensation. Um, Radiographic standards emerged really after about 19, uh, 19, in the 1980s, and cerebellar tonsillar herniation was easily identified. And we went through periods where it was thought to be three millimeters and uh, three to four or four to five, and now it's kind of five or better with a lot of the uh, interesting uh, uh, papers, both in, uh, as you heard Dr. Uh, Cormac Mayer describe yesterday, really understanding what the uh, normal uh, position of the tonsils are over the, over the course of, of, of the lifespan, <clears throat> and then how this can change, and how either, even on imaging technologies, there can be a little bit of a wibble wobble of the tonsillar descent of one or two millimeters, depending on the technology and the, and the uh, uh, nature of the imaging studies. Uh, <clears throat> a better understanding of the complexity of the skull base was, began to be formulated really in the, uh, around in the 1990s. Uh, Dr. Nishikawa and some of his Japanese colleagues uh, began to understand better the, uh, the areas of formation of the, of the uh, skull base uh, cellular structure development and em developmentally and embryologically. Our skull is formed by pretty simplistic uh, parietal plates and frontal and occipital bones, but the skull base is a lot more complicated. There are a lot of growth centers that uh, have to fit together evolutionary and developmentally. And we understand also that our skulls are changing. So our jaws are smaller, our, our brains are bigger, our skull base and the cranial cervical junction has adapted to upright posture, and uh, a lot of those changes are still, still evolving. The basic concept began to evolve as a result of some of these studies that really the major cause for Chiari malformation was a uh, small box or a small or hypoplastic uh, posterior fossa and that the uh, contents of that, that uh, area were too small and the, and the uh, expansion of the cerebellum led to uh, movement of the tonsils into the foramen magnum and uh, compression of the cerebellar structures, and more importantly, the important brainstem structures or medullary structures that are really ver very primitive and very critical in our everyday uh, life. A number of uh, morphologic criteria began to be developed, and uh, not many of them have survi survived or, or, or very widely used, but the BDI, or the measurement from the tip of the clivus to the tip of the osseous tip of the dens, or the odontoid process is one that is still quite in wide use, and you'll hear a lot of talk about the CXA, or the clival axial angle, which is formed by uh, a, a line across the clivus and a line at the posterior margin of the odontoid, and the, and the degrees uh, uh, of measurement of that, which are generally above 140 or 145 uh, degrees. The, uh, you've heard and seen some of the uh, imaging studies which have showed the critical problem with CSF flow in the posterior fossa to the spinal uh, circuits, and here you see uh, uh, an example of that where the flow, you can see the white to black shift 
uh, which is re resulting from a change in direction of spinal fluid flow across, and you can see there's very little flow posterior where the tonsils are down, descended beyond C1, and uh, there is compression anteriorly, even though there's not much retroflexion of the odontoid, it's still it's a tight space. <clears throat> Additional studies done after 2000 identified some interesting aspects of the frame and magnum. This is where the rubber meets the road, basically, and this is what we're talking about uh, when we say that there's constriction or pressure in the, uh, uh, the tonsillar structures on the, on the brainstem. Uh, this is a complex picture of the growth areas that come together in a normal infant. This is a normal adult structure at the frame and magnum. This is an axial image cut across this way. So this is the opening through which the uh, spinal cord begins to descend into the spinal canal, and it's kind of a circular structure. In Chiari-1 malformation, <clears throat> you can see that traditionally this is uh, observed to be a more ovoid structure. So you can see how not only there can be compression by retroflexion of the odontoid or by a pushdown of the structures into the smaller space, but there's also uh, ample opportunity for lateral compression of the tonsils in a narrowed foramen magnum, and this, this is uh, part, of the, part of the process that goes on in that region. In cranial synostosis, there's some similarities. Cranial synostosis are disorders of uh, formation of the separate parts as the gro growth centers come together, and uh, there are some rare conditions that uh, result in uh, constriction of this uh, uh, frame and magnum space. In the uh, uh, Chiari malformation with uh, tethered cord syndrome, there are some, we begin to see some changes which are sort of in a, in a uh, developmental process from Chiari 1 to Chiari 2. In Chiari 2 malformation, the frame and magnum is a lot larger, and that is because the uh, growth of these bony plates was constricted by a lot of neural elements that were there. There's kind of a feedback. As the brain goes, the brain, brain grows, the brain case expands to accommodate it, but it's also, as that growth of the, of the skeletal elements uh, proceeds, it begins to be more restrictive as well. So there's a give and take. We see sometimes in the posterior fossa uh, the uh, superoxid, but there's a lot of thinning, sometimes almost uh, paper chip uh, or potato chip-like thinness of the occipital bone because of pressure from the uh, enlarging cerebellum. Um, in uh, 1999, Dr. Millerad, uh, in a pivotable paper where we uh, once again defined or tried to redefine Chiari malformation. It really transitioned from uh, a condition that was uh, understood to be, as I said, uh, cough, headache, ataxia, and downbeat nystagmus to a much more complicated uh, clinical presentation. What's important to emphasize here is that uh, there's really a wide range of clinical symptomatology that is not infrequent. Uh, and uh, although occipital headache is the, kind of the hallmark greater than 80% of patients, uh, there are some patients that can present without any headache. Uh, some headaches may be very intermittent or not recognized. A patients ad adapt their daily existence to avoid the headaches, not, not uh, lifting or not straining. And, and uh, uh, ocular disturbances are very common. Uh, floaters, blurred vision. Blurred vision related to probably uh, mild increases in intracranial pressure and uh, photophobia and diplopia uh, uh, are not uncommon. There are a lot of acoustic and vestibular complaints, tinnitus, and about 75% of patients actually have tinnitus and, and, and uh, dizziness or unsteadiness, which uh, we are only beginning to understand a little more as a central kind of uh, vertigo. Uh, oftentimes it's put off to benign positional vertigo or peripheral vestibular kind of mechanism with hearing affected, but uh, there's more and more evidence accumulating that this is a central kind of vertigo. Uh, dysesthesias are common. We'll make a distinction between a dysesthesia, which is a funny feeling in the hands, and actually sensory loss. Chiari patients are more... Uh, more uh, uh, incapacitated by dysesthesias than actual sensory loss. Uh, it kind of complicates the clinical picture because when you try to assess patients, are they, do they have sensory loss? You oftentimes don't find it because that uh, dysesthesias are the prelude to more serious loss of sensory function. Dysesthesias are, are really common about 60% of the time. 
chronic fatigue and bulbar symptoms, uh, sleep apnea, palpitations are common things which in the, uh, we, we have come to learn in the connective tissue diseases really begin to be uh, a greater and more uh, important uh, part of the clinical presentation. So there are also segmental pains or pain that is extending down dermatonal regions that we understand are spinal cord related and impaired memory, concentration, neck pain, low back pain, urinary incontinence. So a wide range of symptoms that begin to uh, come forward in these, these patients. Um, as time progressed after 2000, um, uh, we began to understand that there were groups of patients that uh, had uh, a curious kind of hypermobility uh, and uh, or connective tissue disorders that we now term uh, under the term global term of Ehlers-Danlos kind of syndromes, which include uh, Marfan syndrome and a, a number of uh, about eight or nine or ten categories of different types of constitutional hypermobility in the joints. And we'll see that this is an increasingly important aspect to distinguish among these patients, that neurologists have been rife in our understanding of various diseases by masquerading diseases. Syphilis was one of the chronic ones. Syphilis would masquerade as uh, hearing loss, cognitive effects, ver uh, vestibular problems, peripheral neuropathy, and a number of things. Multiple sclerosis, similarly. And many of the Chiari patients are initially evaluated for the possibility of MS. Um, and uh, Chiari is certainly one of these. And uh, hereditary disorders of connective tissue are really rising to the top of the list as, as mimicking other disorders, arthritic disorders, neurological disorders uh, of one type or another. So this is a, was an important recognition. And I'll see, uh, let you see how important it is in the distribution of patients that uh, look like Chiari patients. Uh, so, uh, in some imaging studies, which I won't belabor too much, we can see here when a patient stands up, they have increase in this clival axial angle because of laxity, and there's actually a downward shift on, on upright posture of the tonsils, and you saw this demonstrated uh, yesterday in, in additional uh, imaging. And then uh, there's also uh, the issue of tethered cord problems, which we understand may be part of the evolution of the formation of the uh, neural tube and the development of the spinal elements, both from the skull to the uh, sacrum. Um, Dr. Gilmore talked a lot about this, so I won't uh, belabor it. And uh, this is, uh, although cl clinically the uh, occult tethered cord syndrome, particularly in the adult population, still remains fairly controversial. But uh, I'll just show you some images. This is a 21-year-old a male with uh, uh, carry one uh, identified by tonsillar descent here. And uh, here, uh, this was imaging before section of the phylum terminale, has a quite significant cervical syrinx. And, uh, and uh, 15 years after that, you can see uh, there's no Chiari malformation. He didn't benefit from posterior fossa decompression, and the, and the uh, significant syrinx is, has uh, remained absent. Uh, this is a uh, eight-year-old young girl, had failed Chiari surgery. Uh, the uh, MR images were before and five weeks after uh, section of the phylum terminale uh, show uh, remarkable decrease in syringomyelia, even in the cervical area. So, uh, so images and, and experiences like this show the uh, valuable aspect of tethered cord as it may or may not participate in, uh, uh, in the development of tonsillar descent and, and presentations like Chiari-1 malformation. This is another 36-year-old male uh, with uh, Chiari-1 malformation and tethered cord before and six months after section of the phylum terminal. And this individual just had a thoracic syrinx, and you can see without any other surgical intervention that this syrinx is remarkably uh, collapsed six months after section of the phylum terminale. So this is an important thing to recognize. Probably a more recent evolution, you heard about this yesterday from Dr. Uh, Dr. Fuchs about patients that have spontaneous CS left Seth leaks and intracranial hypotension. Uh, CSF leaks can have uh, a number of etiologies, some of which might be surgical. But in addition, our, e our EDS population, which has stretchable uh, areas, we knew as we began to look at, at uh, LP studies to look at intracranial pressure, that there was a much greater incidence of, uh, of uh, low pressure and uh, LP complications in the EDS population. Probably we ex anticipate less than about uh, 2 or 3 percent uh, uh, 
uh, incidence of uh, low pressure headaches after routine spinal tap and at spinal taps for diagnostic purposes, uh, since a little greater, maybe 5% after obstetri obstetrical procedures uh, like uh, 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 spinal anesthesia and epidural uh, anesthesia. But in the EDS population, about 15% of our patients, or 20% even, after simple spinal taps will have prolonged history going back two and three and four weeks of uh, longstanding uh, headache patterns from CSF leaks. And they can have some spontaneous leaks. Here you can see uh, with these uh, images Images, uh, MRI images to look for fluid. This is fluid extravasated from the uh, uh, extradurally here. And here are blebs uh, uh, that can develop uh, because of uh, distension, almost like di people are more familiar maybe with diverticulosis in the colon uh, because people have outpouchings of the col colonic space. But in the, in the CSF space, particularly in the lower levels of the spinal uh, circuit, uh, you can have uh, uh, these tar loss cysts or uh, uh, epidural outpouchings that will uh, uh, lead to CSF leakage. And then you saw some earlier other pictures of patients with uh, uh, thickness of the meninges on en enhanced MRI scans and a typical kind of uh, post-LP headache. In 2009, we looked at, at that time, we had accumulated about 3,378 uh, Chiari patients, patients with Chiari malformation. So we looked at a subgroup of those patients with five millimeters or more uh, tonsillar herniation and they had, that had complete imaging studies um, and uh, uh, look at the uh, both MRI and CT imaging. And they had no prior history of any surgical treatment and no patients uh, younger than 15 or older than uh, 69. And it was interesting to see how the distribution of those patients that were, you know, Typical tonsillar descent. Well, it turned out only about 52% of those patients actually had what we might have called classical TRE1 malformation or a small or hypoplastic posterior fossa. Uh, although we may have had some referral bias for this, about 30% of the patients actually had craniocervical instability as a result of disorders of uh, connective tissue or post traumatic, because that's another etiology. Uh, uh, head injuries, usually uh, whiplash kind of injuries, can strain and tear uh, ligaments not only in normal people but excessively so in patients with connective tissue disease. There were about 7% of the cases had uh, 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 classical tethered cord features and intracranial space occupying lesions pushing down causing tonsillar descent was 4%. Uh, lumbar per peritoneal shunting, which uh, Dr. Fuchs talked about uh, and, and Dr. Um, Rickey, about 4%. Cranial synostosis cases, again, much less as well as uh, form thrusts of Chiari 2 and patients with myelodysplasia. So that was a total of almost uh, uh, 750 patients. Uh, in uh, about 2010, uh, we put together a paper about looking at uh, trying to shift the balance from identifying tonsillar descent, and you've seen that th there's been some movement along these lines over the last seven years, uh, that uh, it's not only tonsillar descent, this is only one part of the picture, and we wanted to better define uh, mechanisms of tonsillar descent and try to identify in, 2000, uh, in 2013, Dr. Fraser Henderson, uh, uh, put together a colloquium in which we tried to define really this cervical medullary-like syndrome and how it could be uh, 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 presenting and uh, to distinguish it from just simple tonsillar descent. So again, we see that we can try to subdivide uh, patients based on, uh, on path pathogenesis. And uh, this, uh, simply speaking, I look at these as squeeze down, shake down, pull down, push down, suck down. And uh, it's all a matter of how the tonsils come down, because that's kind of the process we're talking about, constriction at the cervical medullary junction. And uh, here there, you can see that there is an, uh, a surfeit of numbers of disorders that need to be uh, looked at in a differential diagnosis. So these are Chiari malformation, cranial synostosis. We've talked about the um, connective tissue diseases, tethered cord syndrome intracranial hypertension or, or hydrocephalus and other disorders above the uh, tentorium or above the posterior fossa, pushing them down, and then suck down or CSF leak kinds of mechanism. So this is kind of the way I wanted to shift uh, uh, our understanding of these 
and at the bottom you can see the percentages. Now, again, understand, most of the patients that come through are going to be standard Chiari patients. They're going to be, uh, have a small posterior fossa. These are the ones that will benefit from posterior fossa decompression. Patients with shakedown or, or cranial settling mechanisms may be actually, some of the symptoms can be aggravated by posterior fossa decompression because this box is actually not small. Uh, and we need to go through a differential diagnostic approach uh, and a shift in our conceptualization of the problem. So hindbrain herniation or tonsillar descent can have a diverse, uh, diverse etiologies. The mechanisms are, uh, as we described, push down, squeeze down, shake down, suck down, pull down. There's pathophysiology that is genetic, developmental, traumatic, physical, and dynamic. And there's a gradual redefinition of clinical presentations and, uh, and features. What are the problems? Well, there's a lot of historical terminology. Everything gets called Chiari-1 malformation. There are new definitions like cervical medullary syndrome, and there's confusing nomenclature. So this is what the physicians struggle with. If you read old textbooks, you, see, you can see that they don't reflect uh, the evolution and concepts that you're being exposed to in, in the talks that you hear over the, these days. Uh, what are the opportunities? Well, there's earlier recognition. This is where neurologists need to be better, primary care physicians, orthopedists. We need to have better management and differential diagnostic uh, approaches to better improve surgical treatment. And uh, part of that is understanding what cervical medullary syndrome is all about, how it presents, because again, patients don't have labels, and doctors only see what they're looking for. So you have to, they have to be, uh, you know, sort of attuned to the, to the unique presentation that some of these patients have. I like to analogize the problem to that of blind uh, wise men and the elephant. You look at, the, you go to a headache clinic, patients are described as having migraine. An ENT person sees them, it may be Meniere's disease. Uh, the uh, general physician may, may focus on chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia in the, ortho, in the rheumatologic groups, multiple sclerosis, and, psych, and inevitably psychiatric disorders. We used to say in some of these, so you see four neurologists and a psychiatrist before the uh, diagnosis is made. Um, so in cervical medullary syndrome, the clinical characteristics, what may they include? Headache, suboccipital pain, and neck pain are very common, probably 80% or more. Bulbar features and related symptoms, vision, altered vision, diplopia, nystagmus, uh, decreased hearing, tinnitus, imbalance, vertigo, dizziness, choking. Uh, these are common. And the EDS population, which sneaks in here because they masquerade as kind of Chiari. Now, they present with tonsillar descent, but the tonsillar descent is not the result of a small box. It's a result of cranial settling, and uh, it's a result of irritation of those structures by in instability at the cranial cervical junction. Uh, there may be symptoms of myelopathy, but by and large, on the neurological exam, which is offsetting to a lot of the conditions, clinicians, about 98% of the exams in patients are quite normal, unless you're looking for very, very uh, uh, carefully at maybe some uh, uh, rare and unusual uh, physical features. So uh, the underlying concepts that I want to bring home are that... Oh, that uh, aside from tonsillar crowding and the development of a medullary bump, which you saw described yesterday, there's little destructive structural alteration in the brain stem. Uh, neurologists are familiar with many strokes. There are at least 12 stroke-like syndromes. There's uh, ALS, there's MS, there's inflammation of the brain stem. These are all diseases which cause neurologic signs and are destructive lesions. Patients with Chiari have very little destructive structural alteration in the brain stem, and that's what makes MRIs, less, except for the appearance of tonsillar descent, kind of deceiving. Mechanisms driving the symptoms are more related to mild compression, traction, and torsion, which is a new concept rather than more easily recognized and understood infarction or vascular syndromes or neurodegeneration, as in Parkinson's disease or ALS or ALS. The signs and symptoms can be evanescent and seemingly random and oftentimes assumed to be neurotic and psychotic and, and functional uh, because they're just dependent on irregular physical perturbations, physical stress, posture, arterial venous and intracranial pressure changes and external forces. So I'm going to just go through quickly some of the, you know, characteristics, neurological, head pain, uh, occipital, we've talked about this, aggravated by Valsalva maneuvers, oftentimes mimic cervical spondylosis because frequently the pain extends into the cervical region. And if you're 40 or 45 years of age and they do a cervical MRI, you're going to have some cervical spondylosis. Uh, sometimes people don't realize that the tonsils are descent. They focus on the cervical spondylosis, which is so... Uh, 
uh, ubiquitous. Oftentimes, because of the trigeminal projection, there's retroorbital projection. This kind of headache is much different than migraine. Probably less than 5% of migraine patients have occipital headache. Contrawise, in patients with Chiari malformations, fewer than 5% of the patients have actually frontal headache or any kind of headache that really gets confused much with migraine. But you also need to understand that people can, you know, you can have measles and a broken leg. Uh, patients with uh, migraine is about 30% of the female population, somewhat less than the male population. You take a, a population of Chiari patients, about 30% of them are going to have migraine as well. So you have to distinguish the number and kinds of headache because you want to treat those separately. Uh, certainly, Chiari patients can have migraine headaches, and that needs to be treated appropriately. Uh, the classical issue is that it's aggravated by movement, rarely weather, occasional elevation, but um, you can do some uh, uh, provocative testing maybe to get at that with a jugular compression on an exam. It's occasionally relieved in children by head shake and positional changes. Sometimes kids will shake their head back and forth. It seems like they're trying to uncork their tonsils. Uh, I've seen some kids actually watch TV hanging upside down uh, over a recliner. You know, they dangle their head back to kind of maybe keep the tonsils and position them a little bit differently. Uh, there is occasional lateralization, but it's nowhere like migraine where you have hemicranial headache. Uh, it's initially intermittent, but as time goes on, it's not just pressure. It can begins to become a continuous daily headache, and that's what's punishing about it. Oftentimes, the headaches are not as bad as migraine headaches, which can make you vomit. They're sick headaches, as people describe them. The punishing aspect of the Chiari headaches is that they're every day, and they're aggravated by movement and position changes. So the more you do, the worse you feel. And what do you do? You just stop doing everything, and your life sucks. Uh, and so that's a, an aspect of the headache. And people can oftentimes avert the headache by just not doing much of anything, which is not a good uh, solution. Uh, and it's, um, and again, headache is uh, one of the banes of uh, the primary care physician as well as a neurologist because they're so, so common. Visual symptoms are uh, blurring, occasional floaters, which people have. Um, Vestibular symptoms, as I said, tinnitus and, and vestibular problems are, are probably about present in about 75% of cases. The most common physical exam finding I see is patients will be a little bit unstable. They'll have trouble standing in a tandem gait, not just with limiting their uh, orientation by eye closure, but just in balance. And uh, that's probably the most common physical finding that people have, and oftentimes the patients will describe themselves as being a little bit klutzy. Um, and, um, and they may also have some disorientation in vehicles. Uh, an interesting description is patients walking down a, a hallway in a grocery store being dis you know, they put all the fancy stuff at eye level, you know, so as you walk down the corridor, your, your kind of eyes are diverting from side to side. Patients don't do well with that. We have some studies ongoing now looking at what is now looking more and more like a central vestibular uh, aspect to Chiari malformation, which may be related to poster changes in the posterior fossa. Tinnitus is a frequent complication. Uh, it seems like a trivial concern, but there are a few people who have committed suicide after, uh, actually from, uh, as a result of their uh, 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 dealing with uh, the sounds and rushings and disturbing uh, noises that go on in their heads. A slurred speech, there's rarely any major speech difficulty except for some maybe slow or thick sort of speech. Uh, swallowing difficulties are not uncommon. It's not uh, uh, more than sometimes a slowness related to problems with the lower, uh, uh, problems in the lower cranial nerves. Uh, there are a lot of uh, aspects that are associated more with hereditary disorders of connective tissue and uh, tachycardia. Uh, many of these patients have had ablation procedures. I don't know whether there's an association there. Some have s symptoms of mitral valve prolapse. Autonomic features, there's been an increasing concern about autonomic neuropathy. I'm a little on the fence as to whether people actually have autonomic degenerative nerve disease or whether these are just uh, responses to the vascular changes associated with uh, EDS and pooling of blood or pooling of CSF when they stand in the upright posture. Because you can have hypotension when you uh, stand up uh, with all your blood rushing to your back, but you can also have low pressure symptoms resulting from standing up and all your CSF running, rushing into the lumbar sac. Uh, gastrointestinal complaints are uh, very interesting and very common and generally written off as uh, pain medication related. But uh, there's a new syndrome that has been recognized, something called MALS or median arcuate ligament syndrome. 
possibly more in the EDS population where the vascular supply to the celiac um, plexes is, is, uh, is somewhat occluded as the aorta and the takeoff of these blood vessels as it comes through the diaphragm. Uh, so we're beginning to look for that. I can't see that I've seen a patient, but we had a patient uh, that had the diagnosis made subsequently, and that's what alerted us to this. You can see this kinking in the celiac artery by the arcuate ligament as the patient stands erect. Um, that can be screened with a abdominal ultrasound and uh, sometimes some CT imaging of, uh, of the vessels. Uh, there can be some functional clinical characteristics. Sleep disorder is common. There's even uh, some rare papers of patients presenting with obstructive apnea as the sole symptom of Chiari 1 malformation. Uh, cognitive dysfunction is still, there's been a few papers, Dr. Oro and uh, Dr. Frim and, uh, have uh, contributed some of this, but we need more uh, understanding of uh, uh, the aspects of uh, cognitive function. We did uh, some unpublished data that tried to look at this, and, and we didn't find any major. We were looking for cerebellar deficits, but there were abnormalities in, in complex things that don't come out in the neurologic mm -hmm. bedside exam, executive function, multitasking kind of issues. Uh, which are uh, uh, need really uh, clinical neuropsychological assessment. So physical findings, uh, we talk about downbeat and nystagmus. I only see that maybe about 5%. The patient population which is coming to the front is, is really uh, a lot different than it was years ago when the diagnoses were made on autopsy findings. Uh, downbeat and nystagmus is probably the hallmark finding, but I've, on, op, uh, on fundoscopic exam, I often see patients have kind of jittery eye movements. You can't detect on looking at the eyes, but uh, this is uh, an underlying uh, abnormality that has got to do with uh, 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 the uh, uh, control of eye movements related to visual function. INOs are internuclear thamoplegias, which are common uh, in uh, in uh, which are common in uh, in MS are very rarely seen. But there can be an interesting kind of adult onset esotropia on up days, which has been suggested possibly to. Uh, uh, this is when patients look up, their eyes kind of tend to converge, and they have uh, incompetent uh, uh, movements of the eyes on cover and on cover testing. And there's a rare syndrome, which is a superior canal dehiscence syndrome from pressure in the posterior fossa. There's unroofing of one of the, the superior uh, canal, which uh, when you cough or sneeze, can cause a, 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 a flow change in the su uh, superior uh, uh, semicircular canal in the middle, uh, in the petrous ridge, give the patient a rolling sense of vertigo, kind of a tumbling sensation. Um, so uh, the, these are all complicated. Truncal instability, again, instability in tandem stands one of the m most uh, ubiquitous neurological findings. Spasticity and, and uh, kinds of things like frank ataxia that were described in the original cases really we rarely see nowadays uh, because we're ahead of the game a little bit once we uh, uh, identify really as a result of imaging studies. And again, I made the point between the difference between dysesthesias and sensory loss. More of what we see is, is dysesthesia and, and allodynia or perverted kind of sensation, pain, normal sensation being painful or uncomfortable. There's occasional uh, trigeminal dysesthesias, not for, although you can, patients may present with frank trigeminal neuralgia, they uh, uh, oftentimes have facial, vague facial patches or numbness in areas around their face. Uh, we've come to use a provocative test in assessing patients with this. Jugular venous compression can sometimes trigger uh, headaches, just like cough or sneeze. Axial loading, which Dr. Bolnesi described, pushing down on the head to look for uh, traction and, and uh, stretching uh, aspects of uh, instability. Uh, and uh, this is... Uh, 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 an ex uh, example of the Baton scoring, which everybody ought to get familiar with doing. This individual is showing the thummy thing. This is the pinky thing. This is uh, hyperextension at her elbows. You get one point for each of those. These are some other maneuvers called backward handshake. Uh, she can spontaneously distract her, her humerus and the shoulder. and she can spontaneously dis dislocate her hip joint. So she's that lax, all right? So as, as uh, uh, other folks have described, this is a little bit of, although it's not very extreme, some back kneeing and, and uh, patellar laxity. Uh, now, uh, in, the, in the 
As a summary, we look at the uh, thummy thing, the pinky thing, elbows, knees, and the ability to palm touch the ground as a screening of nine points for, uh, to assess patients and a very quick testing, what's called the bait and scoring, so people should be familiar with that. This is the t uh, toes to table touch, where they can, it's called, called the ballerina maneuver, you know, they can, they can, um, uh, uh, okay. Okay, uh, now instability can come in several areas. You can see here uh, that there's unroofing. This is C2, C1. You can see there's almost 80% effacement off of that joint on 60 degree rotation to either side. Uh, this is on the opposite side. Again, you can see C1 overriding C2. So as Dr. Bolognese described, you can have uh, different kinds of motion. You can have flexion and extension abnormalities. You can also have rotational instability. And on invasive cervical traction techniques where you actually try to extract the head, you can see stretching of the BDI or the ba uh, Bayesian Dens Index. Uh, uh, lastly, we're going to mention sleep disorders, which are so common, and spells. There are a lot of uh, spells that look like epilepsy kind of problems and distinguish from epilepsy uh, kind of uh, events that <clears throat> peculiar in some ways relate a little bit to pressure in the, in, in the, in the brainstem. But important recognition is that about uh, a high percentage of patients with what are called paroxysmal non-epileptiform seizure discovered to have a history of physical or sexual abuse. So that's an important part of the, uh, part of the history. So what's cervical medullary syndrome? How do we begin to readjust our thinking to look at the patients who don't have labels? Uh, we have to be sure that we understand that symptoms predominate over signs, all right? A characteristic posterior fossa headache is notable, really. We describe that. Symptoms and, and, uh, are evanescent and are related to strain and positional changes. They're oftentimes exacerbated by trauma, with patients being accused of secondary gain from collision injuries and one thing and another. Scoliosis, very, neurologists don't often look for that. Orthopedists do, but we've got to have some attention. Many of the Chiari patients have scoliosis, and sometimes that's a tip-off to spinal abnormalities. <clears throat> Dizziness complaints are frequent. Chiari cardiac symptoms, particularly in the POTS and EDS variants, and neck pain without significant spondylosis, uh, shouldn't be mistaken. Irritable bowel syndrome, joint hypermobility, and transient symptoms uh, without a lot of physical findings are the, are, are the hallmarks of the presentation. Uh, a lot of this work was uh, evaluated and done through the Chiari Institute with uh, where Dr. Uh, Rickade and Dr. Uh, our, uh, more <laughs> emeritus director, Dr. Millerat, has been in the minds and hearts of uh, many of us for years. Uh, the Chiari Neurosurgical Center, Dr. Bolognese and I uh, keep moving uh, as best forward as possible and trying to manage and help with these patients. Thank you.